Thank you, thank you, Gregory, and, and thank you for this welcoming and to give us the opportunity to be here today in this fantastic uh, building of, of the Yacht Club. Um, hello, everybody, and uh, um, I, I want to share with you how I am happy to have this meeting this morning because the story between uh, the International University of Monaco and the yachting industry is now a, 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 a long period of comparison. Um, September 2015, we decided the role of a university to develop some skill related to the industry in Monaco, and one of the important industries in Monaco is the, is the yachting. So we launched at this period the yachting management track, a specialization track inside our masters. And at this period, it was 10 to 12 students every year, but today there are uh, 32, and it's the same every year. And it's not so far to be half of the student uh, being in our uh, master in, uh, in luxury management. So do doing this, we do participate to develop talents, skills, and uh, maybe a better uh, attractivity and visibility of the, of the yachting industry. But it's not enough. We have to, to permit to those students to have a good training. So they are part of a lot of events. For example, they, they do participate to the Manaco Yacht Show. They are involved in a lot of internship in the principality. I think now, every year, we have about uh, 25, 28 internships uh, in Monaco in the yachting industry, and I know half of them uh, are long-term contract. So it means we have a sort of network of uh, now well-skilled people being part of the of the yachting industry in Monaco. It's a network very international and certainly an asset for the future. But to train people is not enough. Uh, the role of a university to support an industry, and we want to do that, is certainly to try to contribute, uh, to ask some question, and to try to answer those questions to support this industry. And thanks to our some of uh, researcher, Dr. Phil Close and Annalisa Tarquini, three or four years ago, we started a sort of uh, engagement in research to try to develop knowledge interesting question that has regarding this industry and the people uh, willing to be a customer in this industry, the high net worth individual. And I'm very happy of that because training one side plus research on the other side is really the role of a, of a university. Last but not least, uh, we like, and uh, we just discussed it with, uh, with Edouard Moussny before, we like to support entrepreneurship too. That's the role of, of a university. And we created inside our business plan competition, the Mark Challenge, in cooperation with the, with the uh, cluster yachting, a specific awards, the yachting awards, to try to support new entrepreneurs developing new ideas in the yachting industry. So step by step, we are developing, we try to support like a university, the yachting industry, and we are very happy to be with you. I think the minimum we can do like a university is to try to give back uh, to the professional people who are very willing to come and to teach to our students. So uh, I'm happy we can give you some overview now of interesting question. Uh, from the academic side that are under work by the researcher and to try to, to think about it all together. Once again, thank you very much for being this, uh, this morning and enjoy uh, this presentation and the different uh, part of the, of the morning. Thank you very much. Welcome again. Good morning to everybody. Good morning. How are you doing today? Oh, que okay, entusiasmo. Come on, a little bit. <laughs> Picking up. I know, I know, I know. We are already afraid. For those of you who haven't been here last year, you will see all oh, academics, you know, telling something that we already know in a language we can hardly understand. That's our reputation. But this is going to be different. Remember what Jean Philippe said at the beginning? We're working closer and closer, and our goal is actually to guide and to assist the practices of yachting, super yachting, and so on. And this is why we're here today, because we're going to talk about a little journey, the past, the present, and the future. And why we say the future? Because it's great, thank you, Charlotte, that you show us some reports validating the things that we said four years ago. So because of that, remember in 2019, we presented our first research about marketing communication in super yacht and how it should be done. And we remember the room was pretty much split. Half of it said, no, that's not true. And the other half said, let me think about it. 
And we are very happy to report that by 2022, we see that the practices have changed and adapted what we said before in 2019. So for you today in 2022, it's a great opportunity to see what's actually happened. You don't have to wait three years for doing it, okay? So today we will uh, drive you uh, in this uh, new journey for us, actually, this is the, um, this is the, today we will speak about the results of our latest le research on ultra high net worth individuals. So, what traditional marketing won't work, why traditional marketing won't work anymore. So, we have some uh, points that we will discuss. So, we will go through the international luxury clients, who are they? And then, of course, we have to speak about the elite luxury clients. And then uh, a little uh, introduction of what our, our research is about, and then the scope of the research. And then Phil will explain you the findings, that is what actually uh, what we work for mainly. And, uh, and then we will give you at the end of this presentation a recipe, how you can make your client happy. Because actually we want to give you something that can be actionable from, uh, from tomorrow morning. So, of course, the conclusion. By evidence. So let's start. So traditional international marketing managers focus on the differences between uh, cultural and then value, uh, value perception of luxury consumption. But with the rise of uh, globalization trends, international luxury global managers, what they have to do is to develop global luxury brand strategies, but they cannot forget that the importance of every single market. So in this very uh, multifaceted and uh, com um, complicated and challenging environment, what is extremely crucial is to understand what the reasons behind the luxury, uh, the luxury global consumption and then what luxury clients value. So when we started the research uh, some years ago, we, were, uh, we, we started the discussion with brands that we do actually, we noticed that what you do, what you regularly do is to address your clients by nationality. Americans, Russians, Chinese, British, but what we wondered is, is the nationality a real point of differentiation? Maybe there is something else that must be kept in mind. But actually, we noticed that also that luxury uh, market research do the same. So they divide luxury consumers by their cultural uh, perceptions. So how do they divide them? They divide them in two groups, individualistic versus collectivistic. So what we have, the individualistic one are mainly largely Western cultures. So we speak about uh, Western European countries, uh, Italians, British, uh, French, or American, actually are the cultures that were exposed to luxury for a longer period. So there, we can even define them as the so-called old money. So the ones that were um, that inherited their fortunes um, and then who were born and raised in, in a luxury in a luxury environment. So the exposure to luxury for a longer time gives them a different perception. So why they are buying luxury products because they want to please themselves for a personal goal. So they don't want to please the others. This is not the most important thing for them. On the contrary, the collectivistic, there are largely Eastern cultures, so we can consider the um, uh, Middle Eastern, Russians, and then the Asian, the Asian countries, so the so-called new emerging luxury economies. So we can even divide, uh, them, define them, the new money, so, or even the new generations are definitely a part of this collectivistic group of clients. And what they buy, actually as a, is luxury because they value, they look for a social recognition. So what is very important for them is to be part of a, of a collectivity, of a group. Um, so actually, when we look in, into the, the, the research, so we identify mainly this, um, these differences, but we also noticed that even research, uh, researcher put, uh, um, identified some shared values. So ultra high net worth individuals are anyhow looking for uh, high quality, exclusivity, hedonism. So there are some shared values. And so this is where we started from. Why most of the research is based on um, addressing the differences. Let's take focus on the similarities. 
all the research that have been conducted are actually uh, looking at the lower um, customer segment of the luxury pyramid. So, and then the main reasons why is because at the top, it's very difficult. It's very difficult to speak with your clients and you know better than me. So they're very private, they don't want to share information, they're pretty in inaccessible. And so when we started our research, we said this is where we have to go. And so this is, this is, so our hypothesis was that consumers have shared equivalent values. Let's look for them. Let's see if there is a more an homogeneous group of consumers instead of um, clients still classified by their nationalities. Um, and some, these are, the other important thing is that uh, nobody is taking into any consideration the country where these uh, ultra high worth individuals then reside. So is the, uh, is the local culture uh, influencing somehow their uh, consumer, um, consumer uh, patterns? So if you look at this map, actually every year the, the company is releasing this, uh, this information. So if you see that um, luxury people migrate every, every year because they follow new trends, because they follow new businesses, they try to catch new opportunities. They're not stable and fixed in one place. What they do actually is um, uh, um, they travel because actually it's part of their DNA. Most probably uh, a father, American father and a British mom, and then they started in Singapore, and then they went to another country to set their first business, and then they opened new branches in other countries. So this is what they do. They are not, uh, they're, they're, they're not living their life in one country only. So this is why we cannot classify them by nationality. And then by stats, we can even say that all of these people, on average, they have nine different properties in different luxury, um, in different um, markets. So it is extremely important that we try to understand who are they. So we know that they, they, they move around and then uh, you know who are they. They are the wealthiest. They are 30 more bill, uh, billions in uh, investable asset. But why they are very important? Because despite of being a very small number of people overall in the entire population, the impact of, of their wealth on the global economy is extremely important. If you think about the uh, the 80-20 rules, the Pareto's principle. So 80% of the business in general is generated by 20% of the effort, 20% of the best uh, selling products, or 20% of, of your clients. More precisely, in luxury, actually there is a rule that is called the 550. The 550 means the 50% 50 of your business is generated by only 5% of your very rich clients. This is why these clients are the most sought after clients for all of you, for all of your companies. Because they are the ones that are generating with less effort the majority of your profits. So because we know they are extremely important, uh, we, decided, we decided to define a specific research. So we wanted to identify ultra high net worth individual consumption patterns and motivation in uh, and motivation to purchase absolute luxury, so the uber luxury products. And why we wanted to do that? Because according to us, we, there are some similarities. They are an homogeneous group of consumers. They, are not, they don't have to be addressed by your marketing strategies as uh, Americans, British, but it's an overall. And so what we want to offer today is a recipe, actually as a, as a solution, are some uh, insights that can help you to address in a more accurate way your luxury brand strategies. Phil, what are our findings? Oh, sorry, this is still me. Sorry, I forgot. But actually, how we designed the research. Uh, according to Ben, can you click, sorry. Yes, according to Ben and Company, we can divide the, log the, the luxury global consumption in different nine segments. And then, uh, but only three, according to them, refer to the exclusively, that are exclusively accessible to the ultra high net worth individuals. And so we decided to stay focused only on the student. 
so private jet and yachts. So we have already started something on the fine arts, so we will think maybe in the future, but for the moment, we decided to stay focused on only on these two industries, and then we interviewed several private jet flyers and uh, private jet owners, uh, yacht owners, sorry. So Phil, now the stage is yours. For now, new insights, a glimpse into the future. As Jean-Philippe pointed out, we want to guide you, we want to help you, we want to assist you. So we share some of the things that we find out. Because we wanted to look at what are really the main drivers for luxury consumption of the ultra high net worth individual. In short, what matters most to your clients? And what we found out was, first of all, it's a homogeneous group. You're almost all the same, which came as a big surprise to some of the people we spoke to, but not as a big surprise to us, because we thought when you look at consumer segments, they often have more in common than they do not have in common. And when we talked to the industry, there were questions, what about the difference between a Russian customer, a Chinese customer, values, gender, education, where were you born, where were you raised. And one thing we find out, it doesn't really matter. It's irrelevant, which is great news for you, because you can now cater your marketing, sales, promotion, communication strategy based upon a blueprint, a DNA that works for all ultra high net worth individuals, instead of trying to find out how do we cater to them? Do I need to speak differently to them? Etc. And it's the utilitarian nature of luxury. What do we mean by that? Often luxury is described as aspirational, hedonic, and everything that comes with it. When you ask ultra high net worth individuals, this is not the case. It's everyday life. It's mundane. And I mean, when you look at it, what they really value and what they are addicted to is convenience. Why convenience? Because convenience makes their life easier. And as Charlotte pointed out, look at the people below 45, so we will never make it, unfortunately. <laughs> below 45, what are they looking for? They're self-made people. They run their business. They are busy. So what they are looking for, make my life and my interactions with you, the service providers, as convenient as possible. Because only then you will save me time. And time is priceless. You want to know what the number one currency is for an ultra high net worth individual? Give me time. If you save me time, you got me. And the focus is clearly on the word priceless. Because what does it indicate in practice? High profitability. Because they value it. Does that make sense? So looking at this, there's also a clear shift, as Charlotte pointed out, from people who want to experience things rather than they want to own things. Because ownership Headache, experiencing it, convenience, time savings. One leads to another. It's a story that's developing here. Does that make sense? Can you relate to it? Reflect on the conversation up with your clients. I'm sure you will find something there. So, ultra high net worth individuals are all the same. Of course, they're not all the same. But in terms of your practices, you should think of them as a homogeneous group, what they have in common. There's only one difference, which Charlotte related to, old money versus new money. The more you go into new money, entrepreneurship, the more you go into words time savings, convenience, away from ownership. Does that make sense? It all comes together, and they all think the same, like the same. What about the utilitarian nature of luxury? What do we mean by utilitarian? It's functional. Functional? 
Luxury is a necessity for an ultra high net worth individual. It's not something to thrive, it's their everyday mundane life. When, it, when we first heard people asking us, your research you have with people who own yachts, who own private jets, they must be so delighted about these things. But when you talk about people who have a private jet, it's transportation. Like we take the bus, they take the jet. It's getting from A to B in the most effective and efficient manner. Remember, time savings, convenience. Same thing over and over again. So when you look at it, we look at flexibility. Give me options. And there you can read the quote yourself. I don't have to read them out. Time savings, again, this is the currency, and efficiency. Be efficient, be effective. Use the tools that I use, not what you think I could use. It's all determined by what? Your client. Client experience, when you look at it, the client is in the middle and everything should revolve around it, not the other way around. Convenience addicts. Yeah, they're addicted, trust me. We even wrote a paper about it, how their behavior changes. The things that we normally consider with ultra high net worth individuals, looking at options, doesn't often apply. They are looking for reliability. And what's reliable? Reliability means it needs to be consistent. And this is a challenge in particular in the yachting industry where you work with so many different service providers. Consistency is almost mission impossible. Therefore, one of the things that they clearly mention is something that we see in all other industries, one-stop shopping. Why can I not go there and get all the services and the next time they call me, the yacht is going to be ready for me. It should be possible because every other industry moves towards it, or already has moved there. And trust me, again, think about homogeneous. Ultra high net worth individuals don't think about, I'm a yacht client, I'm a private jet client. You fit in a little part of their life, that's it. So they can benchmark what you deliver to what other services and experience they have. Because again, it's about the reduction of opportunity cost. Are you familiar with the term opportunity cost? Opportunity cost refers to the cost that are often hidden. Let's say you want to shop in Monaco. It doesn't, uh, first of all, you only have a limited time to go to the shop. The shop dictates when they are open. Then you have to find parking, you need to get there, you need to try it on, and if you're lucky, they have it at your size. If not, you're going out, time, efficiency, everything wasted. It all comes back to convenience and time savings. Because time savings, time is priceless. It's what they value. This is what they need. We refer to the point of quality time. So if you save me time somehow that I can use to gain memorable experiences on my yacht, on my jet, with my precious one, with my beloved ones, then you got me. And again, the emphasis is on priceless because they are willing to pay for it. So many interviews where we heard people saying, Yes, it's ridiculous to be on my Challenger and fly alone to New York. But I get back to my family in no time, and that's worth it. This is what you need to keep in mind. It's worth it. And people even said, that's priceless, especially the younger ones. So if you talk about how they describe private jets, for example, it's a drug. It's a time machine. It's what saves them and delivers what they are looking for. 
Does that make sense? Okay. Old money versus new money. I leave that up to you, Annalisa, because it's kind of your... <laughs> <clears throat> so the only difference that we have identified conducting several research is that um, despite of the fact they share so many values, there is a, a slight difference in, uh, in um, uh, between these two categories. So apparently the new money, but this is actually what Charlotte was also mentioning before. So the new money, because they are uh, new to everything, they, they are... They're valuing uh, the, the value of time. They're, they're valuing time much more than the, than uh, the old money. So maybe because they're acquainted to their um, they're acquainted to their lifestyle, or maybe because the old money actually being already established, they are surrounded by so many people in their life, with the nannies, with the, with the, the dog sitters, with the, with the several private, private, um, private assistants. So they have already established their lifestyle. Why the new money uh, have to set still so many things? So, so this is why they value time even more. So maybe this is something that you need to keep in mind while setting your, while considering working with them. I love how the New Yorker describes it, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Last but not least. Shift versus experience, especially the new generation. This is what you're after. We have uh, an example from one of our interviews. Somebody wanted to describe uh, to us how he moved from being a yacht owner to somebody who charters. And he used a very delicate example. He mentioned that owning a yacht it's like marriage, years and years, crisis to overcome, high fluctuation. So we asked him, what about charter? And he said, charter is when you meet a nice lady, you agree on spending an evening together, and in the morning you separate, no questions asked. That's charter. Two tickets, $28. Two hot dogs, two popcorns, and two sodas, $18. One autographed baseball, $45. Real conversation with 11-year-old son, priceless. There are some things money can't buy. For everything else, there's MasterCard. Except it all over, even Major League ballparks. That's a commercial made at the beginning of the 21st century. But when I saw it, even then when I did research, I said, this describes it perfectly. It's priceless. And this is what we are looking for. And Annalisa tells you now a little bit farther about some data that manifests and supports our findings. Actually, uh, this is a slide taken from another painting company study. And as uh, apparently they were already um, confirming our our data, so when that we are now that uh, and we announced in 2019. So um, as you can see, there is a, a fast acceleration on experience-based goods. Experience-based goods are actually are what you're selling, are fine art, are your yachts, private jet, or um, a very expensive. Um, uh, oh dear, what is uh, wow. Cuisine equipment, sorry, cuisine, uh, kitchen equipment, sorry. Or even an iPad. Actually, these are all goods that goes with an experience together. This is also uh, what we define the hybrid products. It's not just a product per se. It's something, it's actually, is the product that, is a, uh, that gives a promise of an experience. So this is what these people value. They value the experience-based products. This product will increase tremendously. And so because the experience is everything. And is the, the experience is everything. And then we noticed that, actually. We, we knew that since ever. Because if you look at the traditional luxury marketing and management approach, um, uh, people, uh, luxury consumers buy products for three main reasons functional, symbolic, and experiential. So this, the functional value is, is basically related to the usage of the product. 
So if I need to go from uh, Monaco to Saint-Tropez, I need a car. But I don't need a Ferrari. I need a car. I need a mean, a transportation tool. So it actually, it, it tells me to move from A to B. But in luxury, the functional value still remains. And then what we define in this is the, is the quality, is the quality of the product, is the performance, is the durability, is the, is the, is the quality of the raw materials is the country of origin, is craftsmanship. So there are still some uh, very important key aspects that are related to the functional value. The second one is what we can also define the public sense of luxury. So people are buying luxury products because they want to be seen. So they want to be part of a group, as we mentioned before. Um, so for they're looking for um, social recognition and ostentation. The third one, the last one, this is what we're talking about, is is the experiential value, is the private sense of luxury, is what I really want to get. Talking about the cars, uh, for the social value, for example, I'm driving because I want to be, I want to be seen. Of course, if you, especially for young ladies, are looking for people driving a Ferrari more than a people riding a Peugeot. Nothing against the Peugeot, eh? but you know, so there is a big difference. I'm sure that you, know, you get what I mean. And then about the experiential value, what is the private sense of luxury while I'm driving a Ferrari or another um, sport car? Is the, is, the, is the power of the horses? Is the smell of the leather? This is what I value. I don't, I don't value what the others think about me while traveling. So this is part of the traditional luxury management approach. But after our research, we, have, we can change this, um, this paradigm, because there are two more important aspects that were absolutely not taken into any consideration in any previous research, is the convenience and then the priceless time. So, of course, you can say, but we knew that, but nobody stated as we did it. So this is the most important thing. And we, based on this, we want to offer you uh, some solutions, actually, how you can make your client, well, clients happy. So we will offer you five rules based on which you can, you can uh, set um, doable and then actionable recommendations for your next luxury strategies. Thank you, Annalisa. First of all, expectation management. God bless you, Charlotte. Expectation management means you have to be transparent. We are currently conducting another wave, so we go beyond our 100 alternate net worth individuals in other contexts, including super yachting. And one thing that always comes back from the client is, well, you didn't tell me, or you made me not aware of it. And again, one thing we learn and we teach in marketing for the last 25 years Perceptions are a reality. It doesn't matter what you think you communicated, you have to check what you communicated. And if something goes wrong, again, convenience, time savings, people tell us all the time, I wish they would just have been upfront about it. Be transparent. These people run their own business. They know things can happen. You just have to tell them so they can plan accordingly. So don't promise the world. Rather promise less and exceed it, but not the other way around. Number two, think about it holistically. Especially, let me give a quote from one of the people that we're talking about. It seems like once they have my money, they drop the ball. And of course you can say, yeah, my job is ending here, or my job is ending here. Like a designer said, it's done now. But the client said, yeah, but can you guide me farther? So we strongly encourage you to not be too rigid to say, oh, my job stops here. Your job doesn't stop there. The most important part is after the transaction is gone. This is where it really matters. Remember, post-purchase experience is five times more valuable in terms of them coming back versus not coming back to you or the competition. Something to keep in mind. Communication loop, not a one-way street. Loop, 
you need to go back. Always reaffirm. We found it very often that clients and the people we interview tell us, yeah, they might thought they did that, or they thought they produced it, or they thought they communicated it. I have a different opinion. So you also, and later on we will look at this, you need to look at people who have the right skills. Empathy, listening, active listening. Not nodding, active listening, and using that to their advantage. Because remember, if it goes the opposite time, meaning you destroy rather than save, they will also go somewhere else. Because let's be quite honest, especially the new generation, they are raised on having options. So if you don't deliver, they go somewhere else. They cannot be bothered. If you don't deliver convenience, you don't save me time, I just go somewhere else. Because remember, I buy these things for one thing. Ah, I see the selfie moment. All five rules are on the table. <laughs> Experiences are priceless. The memory you generate, you facilitate with your product, is what counts. So remember, it's not your jet, it's not your yacht. It's not the car, it's how it makes your clients feel. The experience they have with their beloved ones, that's what really counts. Conclusions. Would you like to conclude, my dear? Okay. Ultra high net worth individuals are not unique in the sense that they all need to be catered differently, put into a tiny little segment. This is not fast-moving consumer goods we are talking about here. We're talking about a group that has significantly more things in common than they do not. The only difference we could see in their behavior was the behavior between old versus new money. Otherwise, they value the same things. Great news for you guys. Because no more marketing here, communication here, do this. One message fits them all. Do it, but focus on the right thing. Convenience, reliability, time savings, not aspiration, social, and hedonic value. Homogeneous, they're all what you want them to do. And look at their lifestyle holistically. What do we mean by holistically? When we ask them, how happy are you, for example, with the digital marketing and the e-commerce of the things they encounter with your industries? And they said, it's poor. And I'm being frank. Why? What the industry has not understood yet. Let me give you an example. When they purchase online, it needs to be as simple as buying something on Amazon. Just saying our company is better than the other broker doesn't cut it. And if they have to send an email to get confirmation of their flight while another one is on WhatsApp 24 seven, will not get either. So you need to realize these people Yachting, private jets, arts are a tiny little part of their life. They're exposed to a much larger world and they benchmark it against the world. So if you don't deliver, they go somewhere else. And if you want to wait for somebody else to go there, they will come. And this is where we ask for your help. Because we couldn't do it without you. We need your insights. So we prepared a little survey. If you take out your beautiful smartphones and scan the QR code, you will have an opportunity. Oh, does it work that far? Amazing technology. Got to love it. Eh? So what we want you to do is share your insights with us. 
Because again, remember, it's a two-way communication. We cannot do it without you, but we want to assist you. So the more you tell us, the more defined we can be, and the better, even better, can you imagine it, we will be next year, and more insights. You make more money, and everybody is happy. <laughs> and Except when I said it, there you go. That's there the confirmation. There is a butterfly with us as well. Yeah, there you go. What can I say? We didn't plan that, by the way. <laughs> you know. So please, if you cannot do it now, please finish that in the coffee break. The more insights we get from you, the easier it is. And it's really important because, like our dean said so correctly, we want to cater to you. So if we have future offerings, the more detailed your feedback is, the higher customize we can it to your needs. Does it make sense? Okay. And for more information, you can find us everywhere, even on LinkedIn. I guess there's only one Dr. Ressa Annalisa Tarquini Pauline, and only one Professor Dr. Phil Klaus on LinkedIn. So that's very easy. <laughs> Find us, contact us, and work with us. And help share us with us. So can we so we can help you. Yes. So I would have a question about the charter and the charter. Uh, then uh, suddenly it's not convenient anymore to just focus on the experience. Uh, then maybe owning a boat might be more reliable in, in providing me the experience. So how does uh, this focus on experience go together with reliability? Um, thank you for your question. You are? Tim, Tim. Tim. Nice to meet you, Tim. Thank you for the question. So you're saying pretty much if a charter is not available, the experience focus will fall away. No, the experience is a driver. You know, I want to have the experience. And I, if I want a charter, I don't want to own it because of the headache. So my focus is for chartering in the first place. If I don't go to chartering, I'm not going to say, OK, kill me. I now go for ownership. That's not what I want. So the driver is still the experience. And especially for the new generation, it will be charter. And uh, Charlotte mentioned that already. That, and you know it, the demand is higher than the supply right now in chartering, which of course will drive the prices up, hallelujah, everybody will be happy about this, working in the industry. But you have to be aware that other players looking at the industry, and other players, and we talked with Charlotte about this, who are thinking about the client in a different way. What did the shipyards always tell us and the managers? We don't do experiences, we? We just build yachts. We build yachts. And the people who come in, in the business, out of hospitality and tourism, that's their everyday job. They do experiences. So when they will come, they definitely, right now, what all of our research indicates, they're looking at the experiences and they will be better at it. So we encourage you to use these themes, ideas, knowledge, evidence, in order to cater to them in a better and more efficient way. Even Does to reshape, sense, Tim? sorry, even to reshape your business because there are new players that are taking the place. Actually, we, we mentioned that already. So there are um, yachts that are owned by companies. And actually, they are chartering their yachts. So we met recently one, and then this is what they do, and then do expeditions in the in the North and South Pole. So if if you if you if you won't do it, somebody else will take the place because the the demand is uh, is increasing tremendously, and then because these people can they have the means to to buy what they want. So the, we, it is just a wake up call to. Just improve what you already have, what you're very good, very good in, uh, in delivering, basically. And I believe the cappuccino is now ready. <laughs> Any yeah. other question before a, a coffee break? 
Yes, please. Gregory, sorry. How do you define loyalty? Yeah, so you mean repeat behavior. What we are measuring in our research is normally what we call share of wallet, meaning how much of the business they have, for example, in super yachting and super yacht, do they spend with one provider versus the other? We found there um, the opposite of loyalty. We find a lot of promiscuity. And why is that? Because people always are looking at mismanaging expectations, lacking at post purging experience, do not deliver what you were looking for. So a lot of people move around. There are people who stay, but when they talk about loyalty, and most super yacht owners speak about loyalty, they talk about intermediaries, like the lawyer they use, the wealth managed complement that helps them, the crew and the captain. All the others are free and willing to roam. So they are parts of the super yacht owner experience that delivers loyalty, but other parts do not. I hope that answers your question, sir. Thank you. Well, we are here all day, so just ask us questions. Thank you so very much for your attention. Okay, um, obviously I met you all earlier and here we all are um, with everyone on screen. Um, so I've got some questions and we'll just see where this takes us, I guess. Um, but we're gonna be talking all about managing experiences for ultra high net worth customers. And it came up when we were talking on the phone that experience means very different things to different people and different industries. Um, so I thought perhaps we could start if we go round in sequence if you say, who you are and what you do and some of the most interesting experiences that you've been putting on for your clients recently. Rafael, do you want to go first? Well, good morning, everyone. Nice to see so many uh, familiar faces in the room. Interesting uh, discussion before this one. I love the movie earlier. Yeah, I think it summarizes uh, a lot of what not only the Utah and Networks are looking for, but everybody. Uh, I am uh, Rafael Solo, the chief executive for Fraser. Um, yachting industry, so we've been around for 75 years. we pretty much uh, everywhere in the world. So we've been going through some interesting changes um, the last few years. I've been myself at the helm of Fraser for uh, six years, almost seven, and it has been uh, quite an interesting time so far. And uh, back to the uh, behavior of our clients, uh, we've seen some changes. Obviously we cater for a lot of different generations ourselves. Uh, you know, we all are about the millennials, but we're not only catering for millennials. We're catering for what we call the silent generation, generation X, millennials, and to come, generation Z, which would be probably the most interesting to deal with. And the one which we have to look for, because as we all know, by 2025, about 40% of our clientele would be made of millennials and generation Z. So it's how we adapt and how we diffuse our message, but also how we deliver it. So back to your question. Uh, we are fortunate to deliver many, many different experiences, obviously, in our world. May it be when you own a yacht or when you charter a yacht. So, I mean, I won't go into the secrecy of some of our clients, but we've done a lot of uh, cool things. And uh, we can see that uh, the expectations from all our clients, whichever um, um, generations they are from, uh, we're all in the experience, as we clearly pointed out earlier today. So, you know, we've had... Uh, one of the recent most coolest experience I've seen is uh, a family uh, chartered a yacht in the Caribbean right after COVID. And obviously, you know, uh, we know the boom which Yotin experience has experienced after COVID. So they really were so eager to go on a yacht. And um, so, you know, we created an itinerary for them as they come with a lot of experiences, a lot of uh, good sensations for you and the family. And then we were talking to 
the other part of their family. And nobody knew about the other part of the family, the clients would charter the yacht with us. And then we managed to charter another yacht to this family, and then they organized a, a, a pirate attack on another yacht. So they didn't know that another yacht was coming close to them, and they came up close to the other yacht, and they kind of, you know, created this pirate kind of attack. And obviously, you know, that was a very unexpected in many ways, so the fun of it, but also the fact of seeing your loved ones you haven't seen for almost a year because of the various restrictions. And it all ended up on the beach with a wonderful barbecue and, you know, all comes with it. So I think that's what one of the coolest experiences I have had over the last two years because it was so unexpected. And, you know, of course we can say about going to a, a, a mountain to do a ski, going this, doing that. But this kind of thing, putting two Mem members of the family together and expectedly doing something completely unusual was, was, I think, pretty cool. And everybody enjoyed it, whatever they were, the silent generation or the generation Z. Everybody had fun. Amazing. Alex, can you top pirate attacks? Oh, dear. Uh, I, uh, no, not with pirates, no. Uh, <laughs> so I'm Alex Starches. Uh, I head up all the luxury segments for Pernod Ricard. Uh, globally, so Pernod Ricard is a, a large uh, wine and spirits company. Uh, we're in 86 countries. We own more than 300 brands, uh, of which eight are really considered to be to be luxury or high end. Um, I spent six years at, uh, in, in the luxury hospitality industry before, so six senses for those who are familiar with uh, with the luxury hotel business. So I try to bring in a little bit of luxury hospitality experiential into a business that is not at all uh, experiential by its nature. It's a product that you buy. Yes, there's the experience of drinking it, but it's often in a bar, in a restaurant, etc. So when we develop the very high end of our, of our ranges, uh, we try to look for unique experiences that come with the products that, that we sell. An example there, for example, is, is a family that can blend their own cognac of their various years of birth. Uh, at Martel Cognac, which is over 300 years old, we have cognacs dating back to 1802. So there's practically of every vintage, there is some some inventory so a family could come and create their own specific blend for that family and that will stay within the legacy of our archives but also of course for them to enjoy over generations so these are the type of experiences that we liaise with product over time uh, that really become hyper personalized to this audience that we're talking about this high net worth ultra high net worth individual audience uh, that they're looking for more and more unique personalized experiences winston how about you um well yeah uh, founder and director at Barton. We're not actually a luxury brand, but we uh, consult luxury brands um, in lots of sectors, as you may have heard from the introduction, jewelry watches, fashion, wines and spirits, but travel and, and the very highest end as well, jets and yachts. And I think just from an experience point of view, because what we, we have a sort of a broader view across all these sectors, I just, probably the best thing I can probably do is summarize it into what are the commonalities in terms of the most valued experiences for old trying to worth and what does experience actually mean? Because it's a word that people keep using all the time, experiences, experiences, experiences. But some conferences you go to, some people walk out and they're going, oh, but I've no idea what experiences that is, what that is, what, what's the, the takeout for a, a very wealthy person from an experience. And I think the biggest trend has been a move towards and an understanding of giving wealthy people knowledge educating them. And it's huge, whether you're a product or whether you are an experience like a travel company. If you can provide them with knowledge, something they didn't have before that experience started, which is why what we heard in the beginning about the idea that the journey to buying something is more important than the actual end itself. So that journey to designing and creating a yacht is more important than the end itself. And it's similar with, for example, getting a very high-end watch. If you're taking to the atelier and you're shown how it's made, you're given that whole experience, the watch ends up becoming a souvenir for many of these people and that's actually how they see it. It's not actually the product that's the most important thing in the end, it's the journey to it. Why? Because they've learned something, because they're educated, they can pass on information that's valuable to someone else or someone else may not have. And that's exciting and that creates an excitement in life and in the process of buying luxury. So that's what I'd say about experiences and what what they are the most valuable, I think it's very, experiences that increase their knowledge and make them feel that they have actually learned something and been educated. Well, let's sort of move on from that, uh, develop that idea a bit more and talk about 
uh, from everything you guys have tried recently, from when you first started doing these kind of things to now, what you found out works and what you found out doesn't really. Um, one of the things I used to work for um, uh, Barclays Wealth for their ultra high net worth program for something called Little Book of Wonders, which was an events thing. Um, and when that first launched, they launched an incredible range of experiences like uh, tennis with Nadal and Federer and things like that. But actually, some of the things were so amazing that people found them kind of unbelievable and nobody really kind of bought into them because they thought it, was, it goes back to the transparency thing we were saying earlier. People thought they were too good to be true and they thought they were a bit suspicious. So of the things you've tried with your clients, what have you learnt works the best? Um, and is there anything that you've tried that you've now moved away from? From our side, you know, every, every client is unique. And therefore, every experience needs to be unique. Uh, we cannot go out there and say, as an example, uh, to our portfolio of clients, you're going to be uh, spending a day with Federer or Nadal is going to be appealing to some, but not to others. So what we, what we try to do, it's a bespoke experience every time. You will charter a yacht, or else, I mean, we have a good example. We are partners with, uh, with uh, Perrier Jouet, and this is to build up uh, experiences which are unique in their sense. So one of them is create your own cognac, or Perrier Jouet has a wonderful property in Epernay. Um, in the region of Champagne. So it's to work together with our other partners and create a very special dinner in Epernay. I bring in a chef. I mean, they're partner partnering with Gagnier. I'm doing advertisement for them, by the way. Thank you. This is and, a non-sponsored uh, message. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, this, this, this chef is, is unique and incredible. The property is unique and incredible. It's only five rooms. So only by itself. Not If you're not invited, you cannot go there. So of course you need to find clients who are keen in Champagne. Then it comes into the visit of the of the of the of the cave, and now you make one, and you have a lecture back to education. So if you're able to mix all these small parts in your experience, and you target the clients whom you know are keen for this experience, and the importance of your CRM, how you know your client, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, then this is where you have a winner. You need to create experiences for each client, or each family, or group of clients. And I think this is important to go out there with a bunch of experiences and just throw them. I don't think this is a solution. Yeah, I agree. I think it is that, that hyper-personalization that we were talking about. Know your clients and try to really target through emotional connections and, and, and intelligence. Figure out what is it that makes them tick. What are they looking to learn, to experience, to taste? Um, and, and really, yeah, hyper-personalize to them. Uh, we're now in this time of everyone is digital, everything is one size fits all, or fake digital uh, personalization, but nothing beats a real interhuman connection, and I think that's what, what really works well, um, notably when, when we combine forces between different cultures with different passion points, let's say, between wine spirits and yachting, etc. cetera. Um, uh, just going to that back to the point, what works well now, what people not doing as much anymore, um, I'll answer the second bit first. Not as much anymore is just making this assumption that because these are wealthy people and it's the luxury sector, it's just all about having cocktail parties and champagne and fun, um, and that, that's the only thing that people want. It's complete nonsense. Um, actually, people want to take something of value out of it that's useful for them. Um, and, that, and that's obviously where education, I hate to bring it back in again, but it, where it is really useful. So what people are doing a lot more now is inviting extremely special high-end speakers to events to talk to them about their specialist subject that they might be inter interested in that's a sort of a parallel interest to that category. And these people, are these, these aren't just anybody's. These, these are the top of their game people. And they get to chat, debate, argue with these people. Um, and it could be anything. It could be related to sustainability. It could be related to gardens. It could be related to fine jewelry, the actual subject itself, but it could just be a parallel. But the key is they have these passions, they have these interests, treating them as just this sort of superficial luxury consumer who just wants to buy luxury stuff and have fun at parties. Actually really sort of, they, they feel the disrespect in that and that you actually have to respect them by saying, no, we know you, you respect information, knowledge, something useful, something good. And so I think, Anything that pushes something more of that rather than just says, 
here's some champagne, go and have fun, is I'm sorry, not to say champagne is a problem at all. We see exactly the same thing. But it's a, it has to accompany something else. Yeah. It's really interesting. Um, I mean, sorry. What is interesting in our, in our world, you know, as you, a yacht, it's where you normally gather with your family and your loved ones or with your friends, but most of the time with your family because this is one of the places whereby our clients are able to gather with their family and have a good time. So this is where sometimes it becomes interesting, not to say challenging, because you have this mix of generations you need to cater for. And you will quickly see that they all we're going to cater around one experience, which principally is mainly education at times. So we have examples whereby we will invite scientists on board a yacht so to talk sustainability, the state of the oceans. Everybody gets us there, but then you need to be able to create other experiences around that for the youngest one. We like to drink champagne in Saint-Tropez on the beach, with moderation, of course. Always. And you always need to bring in and plug in experiences. Because at the end of the day, when you end up your charter or your week on board, yeah, you want to come out there and say, I had a blast. My experience was the experiences. And I think this is where we need to be able to create something which is always appealing to all of them. And they go out, whether it's a charter or your own yacht, and say, hey, I look forward to going back. So one of the challenges of that then, like all of this sounds amazing, creating these events that are highly targeted to individual families or individual passions, but you're all from big organizations or you've all worked with very big organizations. How do you manage the logistical challenge of, you know, you've got a large number of ultra high net worth clients. How do you ensure the consistency in what you're offering and, and how do you, you know, how do you do that for every single client that Fraser is working with, for example? Well, from our side, as I said earlier, you know, we, we have to know our clients. That's key here. And it's been challenging lately because of the change in the industry and the influx of new clients, I mean, for ourselves, and I can speak on behalf for the entire industry, I believe, we had 40% new clients coming the last two or three wow. years. Yes. And the average age went from 65, 55 to 65 to 45 to 55. So there's quite a switch here. So it has been challenging to get to know them, but that's what we're here for. This is our job. And uh, we have a team of specialists whose duty is to understand who they're dealing with. May they sell or buy a yacht for somebody, or else may they organize a charter for someone. So this is key, and this is where we spend time with our teams for them to get to know their clients and understand what they want. So the first time, it might not be the right thing, all in, but this is key for them to come back to you and, uh, and uh, make sure they also tell their friend they should come to us and enjoy a charter or buy a yacht. So I think it's a, a team. I mean who know what they're doing on top of their game, understand also the changes clients are going through in terms of their expectations. And of course, you also work with a lot of partners, one of which is here, but we have also partners in jet companies, we have partners uh, in various destinations we're going to, and we build a program with them. And of course, the most important, your crew on board the yacht, because they are part of the equation. They need to know. Of course, if you own the yacht, they will know you quite fast. But if you charter a yacht, it's very important they understand you, what you want, what you're expecting. And this is a part of our uh, duty here to make sure that they know what our clients are expecting to get from the yacht and the crew on board. Yeah, I, I, I agree with you on the, on the, on the people thing. It is, it is truly a people's business at this high end. Um, it cannot be replaced by digital. It's facilitated by it, but it cannot be replaced, uh, I firmly believe. And we have, as I said, we're in 86 countries in the world, uh, but only in about 20, we have teams of private client managers, VIP managers, as we call them, in place that will liaise directly with the target audience within that market. So that's how we ensure, at least attempt to ensure, consistency across all these different uh, countries. Our clients are global, of course they are. Uh, they're between China, the US, Africa, Asia, and anywhere else you'd like. So if they travel, of course, we need to be able to ensure there's always someone relevant wherever they, they, they arrive that they can pick up the phone to and, and, and have a chat with and find out, okay, where can I, where should I go for dinner? Where can I uh, find your product uh, or deliver it even before they arrive? So having that global network of the right people, especially in a business that is, and I, I, Pernod Ricard, I say that with all the respect, of course, it's a FMC 
CG business. We are a large organization, 20,000 people, it's, it's big. Um, but having the right people with the right mindset and the right culture when it comes to the luxury of the ultra high net with client target audience is, is essential. Data, um, really good um, CRM systems, essentially just really tidy and tight. You have to have all the information. Um, you know, some of the best companies in, in the world now in this area are using, they're able to sort of bridge their own CRM with external data providers so they can get 360 information from everyone in the world. You have your client, Mr. Smith, and there might be four other companies around the world that have information on Mr. Smith, also using, for example, Salesforce, let's take an example. And you basically get to bridge all that together and have as much information on that person as possible. Now, that doesn't mean to say data is absolutely everything. There is a lot to be said for creativity, for serendipity, you know, it, doing something that's really predictable and pushing it stuff in front of someone that shows you've read their biography 25,000 times isn't always a great idea because it becomes predictable and boring. And that's why you end up with companies like Black Tomato and Blind Experiences because things just become boring when they're anticipated all the time with this group. And so having creativity, having serendipity is always important, but the core of it must always be an understanding people, that data. And um, talking about understanding people, when we were speaking before, Alexander, you made quite an interesting point about what different nationalities want and expect and that certain people um, you know, have a different idea of these experiences than others. And I guess it's true for different demographics as well. What have you all noticed about you know, what certain profiles of people want and like and, and how they differ from each other? It's an interesting point because, um, to a degree, I, I completely align with what Phil and Annalisa mentioned this morning, that there are more similarities than, than differences in this, in this audience, and I think that's true. Um, historically, however, our, our categories, cognac, whiskey, champagnes, um, very much dependent on, on regions where they're most consumed. Cognac very strongly uh, in Asia, less so in Europe. In Europe, even the taxi driver this morning saying, well, you know, I, I associate that with a cigar and slippers in front of a fireplace. Um, in Asia, that is totally the opposite. So there's there's cultural co uh, connotations to to alcohol consumption uh, that are that are quite significant. And then when it comes to experience, you have to be aware of that because some people may not want to, for example, have a show off element to their consumption, or they want to keep totally private, uh, or they do want to show off. They want to share um, uh, their 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 purchase or or the experience of consuming it, or being invited by the Maison to come and to come and discover the cellar. So um, I think it's more of a, of, a, of a cultural awareness that one has to have while we agree that the base values that they're looking for are, are similar um, ac across the across the board. Well, um, I will agree, you know, before joining Fraser, I was very fortunate to work for a, for a private family uh, based in Asia with millennials uh, and um, it was a very, very uh, interesting experience uh, because, you know, with digital on their fingers, internet, um, they're all connected, US, Europe, Asia. I took part to a wedding whereby it was a multinational wedding. They were Americans, Asian, European, uh, Eastern European, and there was this connection irrespectively of where they were coming from. And I think this is what we are bound to see going forward. Uh, we will have less and less cultural differences amongst the Generation Z especially, I think, uh, than we have had with the previous generation, my generation or the one before. So I think when you cater for these individuals, you need to get this into, uh, into practice and not necessarily have this old cliche of you know the Eastern European behaving like this or the Asian behaving like that, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I think we see a change here. And I think when you build up your experiences, you need or your program, or you name it, you need to take this into account, especially for the millennials generation Z. And clearly the parents are adapting themselves uh, to be with the families. So I think that's a shift which is interesting to see in our industry and others obviously. Yeah, I, I completely agree with what both of you said. Um, I'd also add that one of the problems is when people purely think in generational silos, most of the time with old Rhino words, they're families. And some of the most influential people 
to the patriarch of that family are there other family members. So for example, on something like sustainability and the environment, some of the most influential people on their thought processes are their kids. Are their kids tend that generation, the younger generation tends to care more about that stuff. And they have the ear of their father and mother who are in the older generation who don't necessarily have or didn't have that concern. But because their kids care about it and they care about their kids, it suddenly becomes a concern. And so when we think about things saying things like, oh, the millennials care more about this and think of them as an individual or trying net worth, you've got to think about the fact they're also influencing someone from the silent generation or someone from the boomer generation in that. And there's always that sort of family involvement. Um, most of these people are married and have kids. And, and, and we need to remember that, that side of it. And that this is, these are groups of people, not just one person with a decision making. Other people in their life matter about the decision making. We, we, the point you made before about the parents will have an educational experience, but the kids want to have some fun and they enjoy themselves. So you have to provide for all of that, provide for the, make sure the whole family has fun. Um, and I think sometimes people forget that in luxury. They think about one consumer, the man with the money, or the woman with the money. And actually, there's other people that end up enjoying that experience. And all of them need to be given that service. All of them need to be given that consideration. And it's interesting. I'm sorry. Thank you. Uh, we have an experience. We had an experience recently with one, uh, one buyer. Quite a large yacht. And then, you know, we went to visit the yacht. Uh, and he was coming back with questions and different yachts. And we were, like, very wondering how and why. And then uh, the second visit came, and we, we got to meet the son, 15 years old. Okay, wow, 15 years old. And the son was knowing much more than his father <laughs> and what he wanted himself. And uh, we, so we discussed with him. We said, oh, oh, do you know, I, on the internet, I've been checking this, I've been checking that, and I want to do this, and my friends want to do this, and my parents are like that. And he came up with that, basically, this is the perfect yacht for our family. And as you said, the, the mother and then the father and the siblings, they were listening and saying, yeah, you're right. This would work for us. So we went from one year to another <laughs> because the 15 years old thought that was the best thing for the family. And everybody followed to some extent, obviously, but that was a very interesting uh, experience so, to, 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 to go through, you know? And you see more and more and more on this. Nowadays, you know, the old cliche for buying a yacht was, okay, if, if the, the gentleman or the lady, it depends where, you know, who is the head of the family, comes and visit the yacht, and they come back with the wife or the husband, it's a good sign, you know, they're gonna buy the yacht, right? <laughs> but now, they come, then the family comes, or the son or the daughter, and they discuss together before they do the purchase. So that's interesting changes. I heard um, a similar story from a yacht captain the other day of a very big yacht. He said, you know, the boss was coming on board and they'd been prepping for it for ages, and he picked them up in the car, and the 10-year-old in the back said, hey, when are we having the longer steam? He was so taken aback, and she had found him on TikTok and been following his videos, so she knew more about what they were going to do than any of the other family members. Um, but you kind of touched on it a bit, you know, different generations, that, um, you know, children of yacht owners are maybe a gateway in one sense, but in, in other ways, you know, lots of these ultra-high networks, there are a lot of different people between you and them directly. You know, you have family managers and family officers and captains and yacht crews and assistants, and it, it's not always that easy to get that direct access. So what do you do? I guess that's one of the challenges of understanding what they want and putting on something that they really enjoy. How do you kind of navigate that block between you and your clients? Well, uh, one of our approaches is working with, with you guys. Because um, we, as a, as a wholesaler by nature, we're very intermediated. So we do not naturally have connections or insights to the end consumer. But if you want to really reach that target, of course, you have to be there in, in, in a direct relationship. And finding that relationship uh, through gatekeepers, if you, if you want to call them like this, which traditionally would be bartenders or sommeliers that would recommend product or not, or disrecommend something even worse. Um, more interestingly is to work with partners um, who are looking to offer unique experiences to their clients and allow us to get a little bit closer to that, to that consumer to better understand them and to offer that unique experience and to better create and polish what we actually offer to their audience and get really those insights um, because the only way to, to get them is to really be, be in front of them. So that's, that's thanks to you guys where we, where we get to not only um, be in front of your clients as in the, the end user but also the skippers 
and the chefs who are essential uh, in, in purchasing decisions, which influences us, of course. Winston, I feel like you'll maybe have a good answer to this question. Some of these things, you know, having worked with lots of clients as well, these things seem like very expensive productions to put on, you know, for, for a brand to be kind of putting a lot of effort into. What's the best way of measuring your return on investment? Is it return clients? Is it their satisfaction? Is it how many people they tell after they've been on the trip? It's a combination of all of it. I'd say the, the thing you're trying to do with this is you're trying to generate emotions in people. Uh, and, and a lot of this, all the things we've done this morning talking about, a lot of this is just about that. Life is about emotions and remembering emotions, particularly positive emotions. Like you had a great experience that made you cry, for example. I'm not saying people, should, or everyone in this room should be trying to make people cry, but actually, it is actually something to have in mind. You're actually trying to get people to have a very different experience each time and emote. Um, and I think that is at the heart of it. People always talk about, they can always remember all of their experiences they've had in luxury that we've spoken to. They can always remember the ones the most, whether it was the, the path to purchase or the experience itself that made them extremely emotional. To leave it was terrible. Um, and to look at the thing that's the souvenir as a memory of it is wonderful. And that's what you're trying to do. So th that is the best return. The best return is when someone tells someone else about you and, and, and is emotional about that experience. Um, I would say also that loyalty is obviously the best thing out of, the, out of this. And that you, but that's nearly always something that comes after the emotion. The positive emotion you're trying to elicit is always that, that you made them feel it once, you'll definitely make, make them feel it again. Um, it, all of that stuff that comes after that sort of much more technical and sort of business-like stuff is, is a product of the positive emotion that you've elicited. So the, the effort should be putting in, into that, that, that sort of sense of creating an emotion. And the, one of the things I think was really important that Tom said from Black Tomato, and I, I think was just worth pointing out again, is that creative thinking. It's very, we can't underestimate the importance of beauty and creativity and the importance of that. It's great stuff to, remembering the fact that time is extremely precious to these people, totally agree with it, and consistency is very important. And making sure they have something that's convenient. The problem is make sure you don't only focus on that as, and, and make sure you are still luxury and you're still creative and you're still beautiful because otherwise you end up being something just a little bit more akin to an Amazon because it's convenient, because it saves time. That stuff is super important to remember whilst you're a luxury and make sure you, you manage it. But remember, creative thought, that whole thing about having the get back to life package that, that people liked, that they talked about, that's creative thinking. Creative thinking and providing something beautiful is always gonna be remembered. They're gonna tell other people about it. That's what makes you special. That's what makes you different. The other stuff is sort of baseline. You need to do that, make sure you do it. But Creative thinking, you need to get creative minds in your business that think differently and think creatively and putting something beautiful in someone's lap. Doesn't always need to be expensive. And you talked about expense. Some of the best things people talk about that they got as gifts or they got as things that were part of the experience was thank yous from organizations were not expensive. They just, it was just that someone had somewhere remembered they said they liked something or they enjoyed something. And it could just be a simple piece of pottery. Someone talked about getting a piece of pottery as a, as a thank you. And that is now pride of place. And it doesn't matter how much it costs. It doesn't matter who made it. It doesn't matter who designed it, how, how expensive it is. It is just simply the fact that it came from that experience and it was remembered and they were thought of. And creative thinking goes a long, long way. And um, Raphael, maybe you can speak to this point. So it's interesting when um, Philip and Annalisa were saying earlier that uh, ultra high net worths view things like yachts as a transactional thing. So they're approaching it with a business mind. I want to get a yacht by the end of the year or I want to get a charter and we're trying to make them have an amazing emotional experience that they remember forever. How do you make that leap between their thinking business and you're trying to get them onto a different track? That's a good question. Well, you see also a, a switch here in, in, in the way they approach purchasing. I mean, some clients, it's, it still remains a transaction, obviously. I won't be lying today. 
but you could see the difference and the shift, you know, before. Bayonet would have been a statutory thing, you know. I'm buying a yacht, I'm, I'm having a yacht, but now you see I want a yacht because I want to experience my yacht. So of course you go through the transaction, and yet we build together, where are you going to go? Or else if it's a new build, you know, that is why it becomes very interesting in the new build. Unfortunately, it's very difficult these days, but uh, I want large windows, I want a large beach club, I want this, I want that. It's all geared towards me having a good time, me enjoying my boat rather than me having a boat. And these are fundamental differences. So I think the transaction part will always be, especially these days where there are very few boats available on the market. People are very keen to buy a boat still. But you see a shift in how and why I buy a boat. Uh, and that's quite an interesting process as well we see. And you can see also in the itinerary, uh, customers are building charters or owners. The majority remains the itineraries we know, but you see more and more and more of the beaten track itineraries. I don't need to be seen on my yacht. I need to be elsewhere experiencing my yacht, my family, the experience, the enjoyment. And that also is something we start to see more and more and more and more. And, um, Alex, perhaps you could talk about, you know, if we're building up these experiences in the run-up to a product, so whether it's a yacht or a cognac or whatever, is there a risk that the kind of the experience and the hype around the product then falls short of the purchaser's expectations? Or how do you kind of manage what they receive at the end of the day off the back of this very, you know, triumphant build-up, really? Well, it's managing expectations. Now, what we, what we saw earlier this morning, I think, is, is totally right. So, number one, understand your customer, your client, your guest, whatever you want to call it. So, what are they actually looking for? Taking into account their cultural differences and taking into account their previous purchase behavior. You know, what is their history with, with us, with, with, with a product? Um, but it all starts with an excellent product. I think your experience can be great, but if the product is, is, is not up to the standards of, of what these consumers are looking for, you shoot yourself in the foot. So we would not release anything that is not considered perfect uh, in, our, in our eyes. We released a 100-year-old cognac last year from 1921. We only made 50 bottles uh, in collaboration with Baccarat. All were sold before they even landed. But it was a 100-year-old cognac. In that product, we selected the, the one barrel that was just absolutely perfect that we could release for that. Um, at 25,000 euros, which in our industry is, is a lot, I know it's nothing related to, to yachts or, or, or to, to watches and, and etc. but um, in our industry it's a lot of money. Um, so people expect this kind of, the, the, this kind of super high-end product behind the experience. And the experience comes with the delivery. People come to the chateau to experience and hand over, for example, or they have access to the cellar master. I think this is another, another essential piece, access, that they, as a very, very small group of people uh, on a one-to-one -one basis can meet the person that actually put this product together. That is the guardian of, of the history of a house. So another another essential element, I think, but, but managing all those parts of the journey um, and, of course, close the feedback loop because it's a holistic approach. Um, it's not just now I've sold it, that's it. No, how about the next year's edition? How about thinking of you when it's your birthday and not purely transactional, thinking beyond this? You had a very fair point, I think, about the smallest thing can may, mean, mean the most when it's something purely emotional, human, not just transactional. And I think that's, that's where we really need to, need to close well to not feel that the experience falls short of the expectations uh, beyond the product. And um, when we're talking about the, um, I'm aware we've not got much time left, but when we're talking about the, you know, the customer journey and things not just ending when they buy the yacht, when they buy the cognac, when they receive the piece of pottery, in your heads, when does the journey end? Is there a cutoff point where you say, you know what, we've invited this guy back five, five times now. You know, now is the time that we say, okay, that customer relationship has closed down. It never ends. <laughs> this is a mistake you should never make. It never ends, even though the client disappear for five years. Never forget about your clients, especially in our world. I mean, we're not talking thousands, thousands, thousands of clients, right? And therefore, you know, a client is valuable for many reasons. Your relationship, obviously the, the financial impact on your own company, and therefore it's very important. You always keep in touch with your client, irrespectively how. You may invite them three, four times, they may never show up, but the fifth time they'll show up. 
And if you give up because you didn't show up the first three times, it's a big mistake. Many mistakes which are made by many people. And I believe, you know, you have a customer, everybody's looking after these customers, all their family, as a matter of fact. And if you stop communicating with them, you lose them to somebody else. So it's very important you adapt your message. Obviously, I mean, some of our clients, they don't want to have their mailbox bombarded every month with newsletters and catalogs and you name it. But you need to keep in touch in one way or another so you are still on their radar all the time. I mean, we've been adapting, obviously, our marketing throughout the years. So of course, everybody today goes into digital and e-newsletters and Instagram and Facebook and you name it. You have to, because it's part of the game today more and more. But you need also to apply all methods, which are, for example, printed catalog books, because they send to their mailbox, they open it, they see it, they touch it, and you're in touch with them, you know? They may not buy a, ba a boat for 10 years, but they may come back at the 11th one and say, hey, I'm looking for a boat. What am I gonna do this with? Oh, this guy last time was pretty good, but I haven't heard from him for such a long time. Let me try another one. So this is very important to keep touch as you can, as you forever, if you can, obviously. I mean, uh, hopefully the, the future CEOs of Fraser after me will do the same. They'll keep touch <laughs> as much as they can. But that's, that's the key in our business. I completely agree, Raphael. It, it, in all the other sectors work in, a great example is some watches. And someone said the thing they loved about Patek, that even though the last time they bought a Patek was 15 years before, they were never forgotten, and they were always invited to special events, some, most of which they couldn't attend or didn't, you know, weren't able to attend. But they were never forgotten. They always sent the catalog, this sort of lovely, sort of almost like a book by Patek every single year. It's like a sort of annual collection of all, the, all their pieces. Just stuff like that that's, that doesn't really necessarily have an end sale out on it. It's just an appreciation of the fact that you are an owner of a special piece, and it made them feel special as a result. Um, and then, as Raphael says, that if you invite them to all these things three or four times, they might not come. Don't, if you analyze it purely on the basis of, well, we only want the people to come every single time, then you, you're essentially getting all the same type of people because they're the people that come to all your events. You actually want to keep inviting everyone because you want all the different types of consumers and, and customers that are out there, some of whom only come to one in 10 events. Um, so uh, analyzing it by how many attend each time and how often they come isn't the best way to look at it. The best way to look at it is exactly that, is you, have to, you can't ever see an end in sight. You have to just keep in touch with everyone until they say, a bit like a relationship, until they say, you're dumped, I don't want to speak to you from anymore, you're blocked. <laughs> uh, when that happens, you actually have to just be blocked and just like, get out of their life and that's it, no more. Um, but a pop bit before that, it's just about contact, staying in touch every now and then. Um, not, and the, the biggest problem with this is obviously volume. Don't bombard them. A lack of bombardment is very, very important because if they just see three or four times the number of emails from you than they see from sort of competing companies or from other sectors, they're really going to have a problem with you. But staying in touch every now and then is absolutely essential for all of your clients, doesn't matter how long ago they were a client. It's a long-term game. Uh, I think. I think for all of us, we can say that the industry is, is built on heritage, looking into the future. Of course, uh, our houses are 300, 200 years old, so they'll survive me for sure. Um, and next generations. You're talking about your 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 client's son. Um, okay, of course, in our industry, slightly more complicated, always responsibly, of course, but uh, families have, you know, different generations that are looking to buy, consume differently, um, and we can cater for all of that in different ways, different products, but to just close the door to the next generation because the father is or the mother is not interesting anymore, or vice versa, um, is a short-term stupidity, I think, and, and, and will shoot you in the foot in the long run, so, yeah, long-term game. I mean, the best testimony is when you've sold three boats to the same owner, right? And one day you get an email from the son or the daughter. I say, I'm looking for a boat. Can you help me? I mean, what else you want? <laughs> this is the best reward you can ever get. Yeah. The best. Well, I think I've got time for one more question, which is just we were supposed to talk about the, the challenges and the opportunities, and we've covered quite a lot of the challenges of speaking to a fragmented audience, trying to do something specific to what they want and how you should handle that. 
what's the biggest opportunity that you can see? What are you kind of focusing on right now as if we get this area right, it's going to be a great thing for us? Well, for us, I mean, I can speak for your team. I'm not a specialist in the other worlds here, but uh, we've seen a boom of requests for yachting industry, obviously triggered by shift in generation, but also the COVID uh, pandemic, which has hurt all of us in one way or another. And therefore, I think all generation, irrespectively, understood the need and the value of having a good time and experience life and share time with your loved ones. So we have had this influx of, uh, of newcomers, obviously, also uh, uh, supported by the fact that the economics was doing very, very well, stock market, et cetera, et cetera. So we need to capitalize on this and be able to adapt whatever necessary our messaging to this clientele and make sure, back to your point of keeping in touch with them, then you don't lose track of them because we all suddenly so very busy that we don't care what's next. No, it's wrong. You know, today is today. We don't know what tomorrow will be. So we need to keep track of them, make sure they're on our radar, they come back, we follow them up, we serve them well. This is, I think, we have so many opportunities in industry. When you see the growth of the wealth in the world the last three, four years, versus the growth of yachting, we still have such a gap. So there's still a, an opportunity for us to grow even further. Um, now our challenges, <laughs> we, we know some of them. I mean, uh, our world particularly is pretty much affected by economics. Um, today, it's quite an uncertain time ahead of us. You know, you read things here and other things there. But there again, you know, there will be still this eagerness for yachting, for uh, evasion, for uh, vacation. And therefore, it's very important that you are able to, to keep track of the customers and make sure you're still there and you follow them properly. And I think uh, this is what I would see our main opportunities going forward and our challenges ahead of us. I think, yeah, challenges, we don't know what's, what's ahead in the media's future, of course. Um, having said that, uh, we will be closing one of the best years we ever had in, in Panoricon, so people are back going out. They need human connection, and I, I firmly believe that, that will always remain, whatever happens, Zoom, Teams, etc., COVID or not. So for me, that is the biggest opportunity, that people will continue to want to be together, share good times together, and, 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 and meet in person. It's great to, for example, even be here. Um, so that's one. Two, uh, I believe, is hyper-personalization. So really get into that perfect detail, one-on-one -on -one, um, relationships, uh, and build the product around that. Uh, that that is that is going to be more and more important. People are their own individuals. They want to express their individuality, uh, and if we can help them do that, create emotional connections in the long run with them, that is that for me is the biggest opportunity, at least in our industry. I think the sense of adventure. Um, the last couple of years have made people realize that we've spoken to just how short life is, and they already thought life was very short. That's why they value time so much. The last two years have been like a wasted decade, and they are now wanting to maximize the opportunities they have for experiences, and travel is one of the best things, ways to do that, to get adventures. So you guys work in a sort of, this is a great industry to be in, because the yacht is really the best platform for experiences and, and adventure on the planet for an ultra high net worth individual. It really is. You can go to so many places, explore things that other people can't get to. Um, you can do things on board that people can't even do on land. Um, and I, I think that, that that itself just provides this huge adventurous platform is something that is a massive opportunity. The big, the big challenge, of course, is um, I would say that who knows what's on the horizon in the next sort of six to 12 months. Obviously, lots of economists are already making rumbling noises about recessions and things like that. And that obviously has an impact upon um, people's willing to spend and discretionary spend obviously is, is something that is affected. However, in my experience and in the experience of many people who work in the ultra, ultra wealthy space, um, Yes, there can be an economic impact, but for experiences and adventures and travel, I don't think that's going to go away anytime soon. Even with a recession, I think people have had enough of the last couple of years and, and thinking about restrictions, about not being able to do anything, go anywhere. Um, and I think that even if we have a recession, I think many people will still have the appetite to go and get an adventure somewhere, do something, escape, get out of this sort of restrictive rut 
uh, of, of a planet we got ourselves into in the last couple of years. Sounds like a very exciting future ahead. Thank you all very much for your time.